During the height of the space race, which began with the 1957 Soviet launch of Sputnik Fenden, an age of secrecy enveloped the two superpowers as they vied for dominance in Earth's orbit and beyond. It was horrifying instead. Aware of their nemesis's imminent use of the new technology to destroy them with space bombs, Americans were understandably alarmed by Sputnik's success. As a response, the United States launched its own satellite into orbit, setting off the space race. Secrecy was paramount for the two nations as they fought for dominance in Earth's orbit and beyond. The Soviets made saying nothing a national sport, denying not only specific events, but also entire programs. However, a Soviet astronaut has just revealed everything. We now know what their space program was up to throughout those many decades. What was the Soviet Union trying to hide? In what surprising ways did the space war affect Venus? Join us as we investigate the secrets revealed by this Soviet astronaut on his deathbed. The space race was a series of competitive technology demonstrations between the United States and the Soviet Union aiming to demonstrate who could travel to space faster and further. It developed as a result of the Cold War, a global ideological struggle between communism and capitalism that began in the middle of the 20th century. There was a fierce rivalry between the two superpowers from the late 1950s through the mid-1970s about who might conquer space first. The space race was an unprecedented era in space exploration beginning with the first satellite launch and ending with a cooperative expedition between the two superpowers. The United States first began planning this endeavour in 1954. However, on the 4th of October 1957, the Soviet Union announced that they had successfully launched a satellite, Sputnik. A month later, they followed this with the launch of Sputnik 2, which carried a dog named Laika making the Soviets the first to send a living creature into outer space. The people in the US went into a frenzy after hearing that the Soviet Union had launched an object into space. It was decided that a private organization should be established to help the American space program flourish after Sputnik's launch. Near the end of 1957, the Vanguard TV-3, the United States' initial satellite launch, nearly instantly retreated to the launch pad. Although the successful launch of Explorer 1 on January 31, 1958, did help soften this blow, it was still decided that a private body should be set up. On October 1, 1958, NASA formally opened for business. But what a drastically different story the early NASA years were. The new organization was just getting its bearings and figuring out how to tackle the myriad challenges of space travel for both people and objects. On April 12, 1961, Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first man into space when he successfully completed a 108-minute flight orbiting Earth a single time. Following the flight, Gagarin became a celebrity within the Soviet Union, but was kept from returning to space due to the authorities' fears that, were there to be an accident, they could lose a useful propaganda tool. Unfortunately, Gagarin met his untimely demise during a routine training flight on March 27, 1968. The United States finally caught up to its Soviet rivals one month after Gagarin's historic mission on May 5, 1961, when Alan Shepard, a test pilot for the Navy, became the second man to go into space. Unfortunately, according to his flight report, Shepard couldn't see any stars because of where the portholes were in the capsule. A crucial turning point in the space race happened that same month when US John F. Kennedy, speaking to lawmakers in Congress, stated that he had ordered NASA to land humans on the moon by the decade's end. Many lives were lost in addition to those won, demonstrating once again how perilous space travel may be. A flash fire occurred during a simulated launch for the first lunar module, Apollo 1, on January 27, 1967, marking the first significant tragedy for the United States program. Soviet cosmonaut 
Vladimir Komarov was the first astronaut to die while on a mission. The BBC reported that Komarov's Soyuz 1 spacecraft went down on April 24, 1967, due to a tangled parachute. When compared to those early pioneering years of space travel, how does modern space travel stack up? It bears repeating that space travel is no picnic. We are still confronted with the same problems that existed at the start. While it's true that new systems were being developed and putting human beings at the top of rockets that were built for nuclear delivery systems, the Mercury and Gemini missions, the truth is that space travel hasn't been much easier over the years. Apollo 11 blasted off from the Kennedy Space Center on July 16, 1969. Four days down the road, on July 20th at 10.56 p.m. EDT, Neil Armstrong made history as the first man to set foot on the moon. Even though there are still rumblings about the moon landing being a hoax, over 500 million people tuned in to witness the momentous event unfold on television. The Soviet Union's lunar program had several failed attempts. Therefore, this was a triumph for America. Between 1963 and 1965, 11 rockets had been launched carrying small landing objects with airbags to cushion the impact, all unsuccessful. After accomplishing this in 1966, their focus turned to sending a human being to the moon. After experiencing a number of problems with rocket launches, Soviet scientists began to contemplate using robotics for the launch instead. Luna 15 was launched by the Soviet Union just days before the Apollo rocket lifted off. It is believed that this autonomous module crashed into the moon's surface after losing communication preventing it from accomplishing its targeted soft landing and returning samples from the surface. In the years that followed, both teams in the space race accomplished even more unprecedented feats. The Soviet space program started attempting to study Venus in 1961. Over the subsequent decades, it sent hundreds of spacecraft in the direction of the planet that is frequently referred to as Earth's twin. Despite a rocky start, the Soviet Union eventually became the first nation to land a spacecraft on another world, Venus, and shortly after, the first to capture images from another planet's surface. When compared to today, their engineering accomplishments stand out. Venus research was the major focus of the Venera spacecraft. Venus was previously thought of by astronomers as Earth's twin, and the possibility of intelligent life beneath the planet's clouds was the stuff of science fiction. The planet's atmosphere is a pressure cooker which modern science has shown may swiftly crush an unshielded probe. Venus has the potential to experience temperatures of up to 870 degrees Fahrenheit. Both NASA and the Soviet Union reached for Venus in the early days of their space program in the 1960s, but were hampered by a series of failed probes. The second Mariner spacecraft, sent by NASA after the first one failed, made history on December 14, 1962, as it flew by Venus, exposing the hot, pressured planet with continuous clouds covering its surface. After multiple failed attempts, the Soviet Union finally reached Venus in 1967 with the Venera 4 mission. The Venera 4 spacecraft made history on October 18, 1967, when it entered Venus's atmosphere and sent data back to Earth for the first time. The Soviets went on to have greater success after that. The first spacecraft to gently touch down on Venus was Venera 7 on December 15, 1970. Before giving in to the pressure and heat, the spacecraft sent data for 23 minutes on the surface. The first spacecraft to transmit images from the surface five years later was Venera 9. Cracked terrain under diluted neon green light was revealed by the photographs sent back by it and subsequent missions, revealing a planet that was genuinely unique. Our hypothetical ocean-covered, Earth-like planet turned out to be an alien world where toxic rain was common. The geological processes of the planet were better understood by scientists thanks to subsequent missions in the Venera series that lasted until the 1980s. On their way to the surface, Venera 11 and 12 both picked up a lot of thunder and lightning. 
The Baikonur Cosmodrome in modern-day Kazakhstan was the launch site for the Venera 13 Proton rocket launch on October 30, 1981. In addition to spectrometers, the spacecraft also had a panoramic camera, a drill and a surface sampler. The spacecraft reached Venus after four months of travel and then plunged through the clouds toward the surface as it fell through the planet's atmosphere. Afterward, Venera 13 deployed a parachute and descended via it. The Venera 13 spacecraft safely landed on Venus's southern hemisphere on March 1, 1982, on what the Lunar and Planetary Institute calls a typical expanse of Venusian plains. The wide region surrounding the landing site is known to have lava flows and small dome volcanoes, suggesting an active surface. Surrounded by a deluge of rubble of varying sizes, the Venera 13 landing site gave the impression of being both smooth and fractured. Upon reviewing the images, scientists from the United States speculated that the seemingly smooth surfaces could be solid rock slabs or a crust of fine particles held together by atmospheric chemical processes. Finds like this could be dust carried by the wind or rock worn by chemicals. By historical standards, the two hours that Venera 13 spent on the surface accomplished a great deal of scientific research. Its camera captured a 360-degree panorama and transmitted 14 colour photos and eight monochrome ones. Numerous books, magazines and websites devoted to Venus now make use of the spacecraft's colour photographs. Images concentrate on the terrain ahead, with just a small sliver of sky visible at the very edges. The spacecraft and a lens cap that was thrown away are both visible at the bottom. According to certain depictions, Venus's surface seems yellow. Nevertheless, scientists claim that the cloud cover makes it difficult to determine the true colour of the planet. A portion of the regolith, or soil from Venus, was also collected and studied by Venera 13's drilling arm in a contained environment. The spacecraft monitored variables, including the drill's depth and rig speed, to learn more about the surface's physical properties. The surface features are consistent with compacted ash materials, like volcanic tough rock, according to the data. The surface of Venus was too much for Venera 13, and the spacecraft died after 127 minutes. Meanwhile, the Russian space program had launched two identical rockets, Venera 13 and 14, five days apart. They carried a payload that consisted of one probe each that was specially designed to touch down the surface of Venus to gather data. Each probe had a microphone and camera that were cutting edge for their time. They would send data back to Earth to help scientists comprehend the dangerous planet. You can hear the exact moment the Venera 14 probe landed on Venus's surface in an audio clip, and then, shortly afterward, you can make out the pyrotechnics used to remove the camera's lens cap. The next thing you know, you'll hear drilling and the surface-level rock being removed. At some point, one can discern the alien planet's natural sounds, which include faint wind rustles and static. In terms of space travel and new scientific understanding, the Venera missions were unquestionably watershed moments. The Soviet Union's Vega spacecraft completed its contact with Venus in 1985. The spacecraft demonstrated the possibility of probes floating in Venus's clouds by releasing enormous balloons equipped with scientific instruments. Launches to Venus came to a standstill as the Soviet space program slowed down toward the Cold War's end. The Mariner and Pioneer space programs prioritised Venus over Mars, despite Mars's long-standing reputation as the space agency's darling. In 1962, American spacecraft Mariner 2 became the first to reach Venus. It found that although temperatures were lower in the clouds, they were scorching on the ground. American researchers got a better glimpse in 1978 thanks to the Pioneer missions. The first of the pair orbited the planet for nearly 14 years, revealing much about the mysterious Venusian atmosphere. It also noted that Venus's surface was less rough than Earth's and that the planet's magnetic field was weak or non-existent. 
Many probes were launched into Venus's atmosphere during the second Pioneer mission. These probes returned data on cloud structure and radar measurements of the surface. After entering orbit in 1990, the NASA Magellan spacecraft spent four years surveying the Earth's surface and searching for signs of plate tectonics. It found that previous lava flows covered about 85% of the area, suggesting that there has been and may be extensive volcanic activity in the past and now. It was also the last of the American visitors, although a number of NASA spacecraft have used Venus as a slingshot as they set course for other destinations. In 1963, the Soviet Union propelled Valentina Tereshkova into space, making history. The United States would not accomplish the same accomplishment until 20 years later. Other nations launched their own rockets and satellites, including Canada in 1962, France in 1965, and Japan and China in 1970. It was commonly assumed that the United States had won the space race after the Apollo program's triumphs even though there were subsequent missions by the Soviet Union and the United States. As the Cold War drew to a close, the two superpowers finally reached an agreement to build the International Space Station together, starting in 1998. The Office of the Historian reports that as the 1970s rolled around, the two countries' ties improved and talks on issues like arms control started. The Soviet space program shifted its attention to launching the first space station into orbit after the moon landing. Unfortunately, an oxygen leak caused by a defective valve, which was activated after the instrument modules were detached from the orbital capsule, resulted in the death of all astronauts aboard the Soyuz 11 capsule. Only the crew of the Soyuz 11 spacecraft have ever died while in orbit. Yes, despite the space race coming to an end and its impact irrefutable, there are certain things nobody knows for sure about the space race, but here are a few things that are definitely true. The fact that the first living being to go into orbit, Laika, perished while in orbit was never hidden, however. The secret was how she died. As we've already established, a stray mutt named Laika was on board Sputnik 2 when it took off in November 1957. The Soviet Union, which had previously achieved the unprecedented feat of sending a satellite into orbit only a month prior, achieved phenomenal success with this operation. Not only did they manage to launch a second satellite while the Americans were still scrambling to launch their first, but the Soviets also put the first living creature into orbit. The news wasn't so good for Laika, though. The Soviets declared shortly after launch that she would not be returning from her pioneering mission. They maintained for decades that she passed away quietly a few days following the launch. Dr. Dmitry Malashenkov of Moscow's Institute for Biological Problems finally revealed the truth to the public in a 2002 presentation, and it was a bleak one. It turns out that Laika experienced a great deal of discomfort throughout the procedure. She had been confined to progressively smaller cages for 15 to 20 days at a period in preparation for the cramped accommodations on Sputnik 2. Once she was on board, she was unable to turn around due to her chains. Space travel was too intense for Laika, even with the craft's cooling fan, carbon dioxide absorber and oxygen generator. Just five or seven hours into the operation, she succumbed to stress and overheating. Was the space race even a race at all? As it turns out, it was a race, but no one knew this until 1989. It was at that time that the Soviets granted a group of American scientists access to artifacts from the manned lunar program that had been conducted by the communist nation in the 1960s and 1970s. Moving on to the lost cosmonauts. The Soviet Union hid the bodies of multiple cosmonauts who died in botched missions to place them in Earth's orbit in the 1950s and 1960s, according to the narrative. Allegedly, these incidents occurred before April 12, 1961, when Yuri Gagarin took off, thus becoming the first person to travel into space. Achille and Giovanni Battista Hudika Cordelia, two amateur radio operators, made a number of recordings that add intrigue to these claims. 
from their post in northern Italy, the brothers claimed to have captured the cosmonauts' last moments alive as they orbited the planet on their death mission. The cries for help were the stuff of Hollywood action movies. US journalist James Oberg looked into the reports of the astronauts' deaths extensively, but he could find no proof to back them up. So hold on for a second. However, they appear alluringly feasible because of the veil of secrecy that engulfed the Soviet space program. True, the Soviets did try to hide astronaut deaths, most notably Valentin Bondarenko's 1961 disappearance. During pre-flight training, Bondarenko accidentally set himself on fire, an incident the country did not acknowledge until 1986. So did Soviet cosmonauts die in the quest to become the first humans in space? If that's the case, it's quite a really well-kept secret. The Cold War was not without its benefits, though. How would our technology have progressed to its current state if the Apollo program hadn't been implemented? The moon landing became a top priority for Kennedy throughout the space war, and his dedication to the mission had a profound impact on global technology. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.